Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. Uh, first study of this week, new week. And we're going to continue looking at Daniel chapter 11. There's lots of things to look at. Um, lots of things we have to sort out. Uh, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Uh, dear gracious Heavenly Father, we invite your presence once again into our midst as we open your word. Uh, we pray for your help this week as we seek to understand the present truth application of these verses. And uh, you know, Lord, that um, there's many things we still do not understand, but we are thankful for the light that you have given us. And we just pray that uh, your Holy Spirit can speak to our hearts. We pray for each of those studying for truth. And we know the struggles that we face. We ask, Lord, that uh, you can help us seek you every moment of every day. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so lots of interesting things uh, have been happening. Of course, uh, I really... Uh, has been spending a lot of time working on that paper on the eclipse, which is going to be ready today. And I'm going to um, post it on academia. And then I'm also going to put a link to it on the video from yesterday. So the video on the symbolic use of numbers. And uh, so that's going to have that attached to it. But uh, with Daniel chapter 11, it's still going to be quite a while till we get this document ready. Probably not till the summer where it will be finished. Um, so once I get this other document done, I'm going to start uh, writing and filling in information on this document. But anyway, for now, we're just still working through putting in the present truth application uh, for these verses. So we've addressed the ships of Kittim and we still have more to look at. So one of the problems that we're running into a bit of a wall, uh, dealing with how we look at these Germanic invasions. So one thing we need to consider is that in Revelation, in the, in the seven trumpets, there's going to be four trumpets that actually address the fall of pagan Rome, of Western Rome. And of course, there's going to be two trumpets that deal with the fall of Eastern Rome. So when we're trying to look at the ships of Kittim, I mean, obviously, we can say that this is uh, these Germanic tribal invasions. But does this happen in four stages? That is, is there some way in which we would look at this? Because uh, there I put German modernism. Uh, but if we're going to connect this to what's happening in the West. I mean, maybe there's some way in which we could, you know, put it on a line. I mean, there isn't a lot of information here. I mean, we could look at the trumpets and then parallel the trumpets uh, with our history. So so let's just take a look at the trumpets, for instance. And I, I'm, instead of well, what I'm going to do is go to one of my papers. Um, and I just never remember the title of it. Uh, it's the one I did on the trumpets. It, I know it has trumpets in the title. It's probably the seven trumpets. Now, of course, we usually focus, and, and when I did my presentations back in 2015 on uh, the trumpets, I went through all of them. Uh, but the real focus was uh, Islam, that is the, the fifth and sixth trumpets, right? And, and also the seventh trumpet as well. So here it is. Use this, this one. Good morning, Dwight. So what we're doing is uh, we were talking about the ships of Kittim. That's kind of where we got stalled on Thursday, dealing with how we're going to look at this history. And uh, so what I thought I would do is look at the trumpets. And we know that there is actually, so this is the paper I did on the trumpets. So in, in this paper, I... One of the things, I'm just going to go quickly through some of the stuff here. So I, I show that the first four trumpets, that the trumpets are not the seven last plagues. This is a really common idea. I've seen this the whole time I've been an Adventist, people trying to reinterpret the trumpets as future events. Uh, they'll, they'll attach them to the seven last plagues. You know, trumpet after trumpet will be sounded, vial after vial will be poured out, as Ellen White says. There are trumpets associated with the vials. But you can't take these 
uh, seven trumpets and just say that they're the plagues. Because we're under, we understand that we're still in the midst of these. We have, you know, the first and second woe, and we're in the seventh trumpet. The seventh trumpet began to sound October 22, 1844. And so all of that sort of futurism that, that creeped into Adventism, people like uh, Roy Allen Anderson are responsible for that to some degree, uh, but lots of other people. So anyway, I show that the I, I compare like the trumpets and the plagues, and they are, are similar, right? They have some similar characteristics, but they also have differences. And uh, it's, it's agreed. Yeah. Do we not accept that the trumpets occur well before the plagues can be poured out? Well, yeah. Well, the, yeah. The trumpets, the trumpets, the plagues are after the close of probation. The, the plagues occur after Christ stands up yeah. and begins to leave the, mo- the most holy. Yeah, but people still keep trying to associate the plagues and the trumps, and a lot of people try to get the plagues starting now. You know, right. like it, 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 it's just crazy. I mean, and, and I knew it was crazy back when I first heard about it, even though I didn't understand a lot, I knew that what people were doing was basically just guessing. They were doing like the evangelicals. You know, well, just... that's, that's why I'm asking the question on this chart that you have before us right now, because it's saying the seventh probation closes. Yeah. So when we're looking at this on the plagues, if probation is already closed, when the plagues are poured out, then it gives it a very very different point for us to consider versus this with the trumpets. So I'm just making my observation. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, this chart isn't my chart. Right. Yeah. Now, now he puts probation closes with the plagues, the seventh last plague. Right? So who's, whose chart is this? I can't remember. I give, I give, um, I think it's the 666 guy. What no. is his name? Uh, yeah, the 666 man. And, and, and I modified a little bit, but that one, yeah, I, I just, anyway, it, it was just a chart. I just was using it as a comparison. I didn't even look closely at it. <laughs> sure. The basic idea is that the trumpets and the plagues are different. That was the main thing I was, so I would, I would just say that, uh, with the plagues, it's not really a close of probation with the seventh plague because uh, the Euphrates drying up and all that stuff, that's the sixth plague, and that's going to be Satan's personation of Christ. That's the time of Jacob's trouble. Ellen White puts that there. Now, I also don't necessarily agree that uh, any of the plagues are literal. I, I think they're all symbolic, but that's that's not a common view. I mean, definitely we know that the Euphrates uh, drying up is, is definitely not... Um, Literal, because the, the frogs, th- unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, obviously are not literal, because the dragon, beast, and false prophet aren't literal. So, so yeah, so this is a paper I did back in 2015, and I th- threw that chart in there, but I didn't really pay attention to it. So, so then we have this progressive destruction of Western Rome. This is the main thing I want to look at. So, we're going to see that we got Alaric, the Goths. And they're going to be symbol symbolized by hail, fire, and blood upon the earth. You got uh, the Vandals. It's going to be uh, symbolized by a burning mountain going into the sea. Attila the Hun. You got uh, this great star that goes into the rivers. Odiacer and the Heruli. That's going to be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and in the heavens. Right. So these trumpets, they're they're going to be described in Daniel chapter 11, verse 30, as the ships of Kittim. Would we agree with that, that it's, that in a sense, all of these are included in that? Or would we say that they're not all included? That it would just address the first trumpet. How would we decide that? Because I, I would just include it all myself, personally. I would just say, well, this is... Just, it's just described as the ships of Kittim in Daniel chapter 11. It doesn't go into the detail that Revel, Revelation does regarding the fall of Western Rome. But uh, the point is that 
even though this just gives us this Germanic tribal invasions as the ships of Kittim, and I put there German modernism, is there in a present truth application a way in which we understand that this happens progressively just as the fall of Western Rome does, and that we could probably, if we took the time, mark out exactly what those steps are. But but they're not specifically marked here in Daniel. So, I mean, we'd have to look at the trumpets and say, what is the parallel to what happened with Western Rome with the fall of the United States? We'd have to use Revelation to do that. Does that make sense? Whether we need to or not um, at this point, I don't think we do. But, you know, when I put something like German modernism, I mean, to me, I'm trying to use the broadest brush to sort of paint all of those influences that are responsible for the condition that we have today. So does German modernism make sense as that broad brush? You know, because I know not everybody's really familiar with what that means. I mean, it has to do with German scholarship, the critical scholarship of the German theologians. They they had a lot of precision, and very intellectual, but they affect so many different things in our society, art and all different kinds of uh, areas of science and culture and philosophy that really lead to the situation we have today. And, and, you know, we can say, well, postmodernism is a reaction to modernism. But in a sense, it's actually more of the result of modernism, right? Because it has to do with how we define things, how we interpret things. So I think it's actually a natural result. And, and in all of this, it's a rejection of the Bible as a source of knowledge. And any comments on that? I don't know how much people know about modernism i've tried to give like a really short summary of it but well we bring this up in reference to this with would quote german modernism unquote yeah and the first thing that's coming to my mind is ludwig conradi well yeah he would be a modernist yeah well especially since it is because of his influence Froome's influence and the influence of others, that there has been quite a division within within the overall church. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, here we're applying this to the fall of the United States. But right. see, I mean, this is such a difficult topic because most of us aren't going to be reading uh, German uh, theologians and German philosophy. But we are exposed to these things. We just don't know what they are. Right. Like. We don't understand where our, our thinking comes from. That is, there's uh, opinions and ideas that just float around that, that we never really examine. And as Christians, you know, who believe that the Bible is the word of God, that it's the source of all true knowledge, you know, that if you look in, uh, you know, the early 20th century, the late 1900s, I mean, there's definitely a move away from that, right? You can even go back to the, you know, the 1800s, um, like, like, um, you know, obviously, uh, all all of this information that was all of this groundwork that was being done on linguistic, you know, analysis of documents and so forth, uh, the rewriting, the beginning of historical uh, revisionist uh, history, so revisionism, all these types of things. It was the idea that man's intellect can can understand what is is true by analysis, right? So we we put man above knowledge. That that man is the source of knowledge. That it's our intellect that that gives us knowledge and wisdom and and so forth. Now, in postmodernism, postmodernism, which is where the time we live in now, where they sort of you have all the deconstructionists, and then you end up with a view of the world where, well, what anybody thinks is true, right? That there's just different types of truths, and and we have we see this in in the world today where 
people live in quite different realities. You know, people used to share a common reality. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about it, like when it comes to uh, uh, what we call the left and the right. See, the people in the left believe that the right, like they have no idea what, what conservatives actually think. They have a caricature of what they believe conservatives think about the world. And they, they think because of their caricature that conservatives only care about money and don't care about the poor, right? That would be how a liberal would think, that they're uncaring. They don't care about, you know, the, you know, the reason why they're against transgenderism is they just don't care. They, they're, they're just selfish, greedy, self-centered, you know, capitalists, right? And then with conservatives, they think that all people on the left are just insane, have no uh, out of touch with reality and, uh, and so forth. Now, there, there's basically a conflict of visions, conflicts of way they look at the world, which is why they can't, they can't, they actually have no common ground to work upon, except that they, they all, in a sense, believe that they are caring, right? And, and many people who are liberals are caring, but they just, their solution to the problems are different and what they perceive as the problems are different. So, you know, you have, you have a group of people, for instance, who believe that Trump is a corrupt monster. He's a dictator. If he becomes president, you know, uh, it's just going to be the worst thing that could ever happen to the United States. And, you know, they got the Trump derangement syndrome. And then, then you have another group of people who think, well, Trump can do no wrong. And things are not that black and white, right? So, you know, we understand from our perspective of the Bible is that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, that, that, that there are those who profess to believe in God and the Bible, uh, but they're actually not living it. They're not acting it out. And if they were in charge, things would not be good. Even though, you know, if we, if we, we can come be beguiled by, you know, the, the, the right, you know, we can think, well, the right is right, right? Yeah. Because they profess a certain type of, of values. But in reality, they're no different than anyone else. So the problems that we have in the world anyway, just kind of rambling a bit here. But the problems that we have right now is that people have no foundation in which to stand on. They have no idea who to trust. And that's because they don't understand the scriptures. They don't understand prophecy. They don't have a personal relationship with God that's based upon obedience to God. Their relationship with God is based upon groupthink, right? And, and you see this all the time, like watching YouTube videos of people in other churches and what they think and how they look at the world. For the most part, it's just like with this eclipse coming up. It's not about really what's true at all. But as a Christian, as somebody believing the Bible, we believe that there is an objective truth, an objective morality, and that as individuals, we have to become, in, we have to align ourselves with the truth in word and in deed. We don't look for political solutions, you know, to the world's problems because we have the gospel. And so that's all been undermined, right? That is the people around you don't know where to turn or who to trust. And if we can be converted and represent Christ, and point people to the scriptures and to Christ through the scriptures, they have a hope, but otherwise they don't because they will just follow whatever trend they think other people are going. And, and a good example of this, you know, I still think this is one of the most bizarre things I've ever seen because, you know, I've followed movements, you know, since the seventies. So I'm very familiar that they were the radical left. They were the ones who hated the pharmaceuticals, who hated the, the modern medical system up until 2020 or 2021. And then they just completely flipped. 
the people who were the most against these big pharmaceutical corporations all of a sudden think that they're wonderful and that anybody who doesn't support those pharmaceutical corporations is a conspiracy theorist. And people who used to support the pharmaceuticals, the right, the conservatives, all of a sudden they flip and they're now against the pharmaceuticals. It just happened like within a few months, they just switched sides. So what does that tell you about people? What does it tell you about our society? It has been eroded. So I would say the German modernism is the thing that has eroded our society to the point where the lie can be believed. And the lie is believed on both sides. Both sides are believing lies, correct? I would have to say that's logical. Yeah. And sometimes we side with with lies because they appeal to our human nature, to our natural sensibilities, to to the fact that we've been lied to all of our lives. And, you know, and I find this really strange. I mean, part of part of what I've tried to understand and and I've I've studied a lot of uh, aberrant sort of ideas and, and the people who believe in those ideas, like flat earthers and things like that. And people believe these things, not because they make sense, not because they're rational or logical, but because for emotional reasons, it makes them feel secure or safe. Like the worst type of person, in my view, is the person who believes that he's skeptical, like he's a skeptic, but never skeptical of the things that he believes. So any information that comes our way, that we, that agrees with our belief system, we're never skeptical of. We're only skeptical of the things that we disagree with. Is that person truly a skeptic? You understand what I'm saying? So some of the most gullible people are people that claim to be skeptics. People who say, well, the moon landing never happened. But they'll just believe all kinds of crazy things that are easily disproven about the moon landing that they think uh, disproves the moon, moon landing, they'll just they'll just believe stuff that you can easily show them that well that that so-called evidence isn't evidence at all, but it doesn't matter. So so the foundation of thought has been destroyed, and the only solution is the Bible, and and it's really an uphill battle. That there's just so much so much bizarre thinking that people have and and i don't know the solution to it i mean i've dealt with people for years and years and years and and i think the only path to truth is obedience to god that's basically the bottom line he that says i know god and keeps not his commandments is a liar the path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day god's word is a lamp unto our feet light unto our path if we want to know god we have to yoke up with him we have to take up the yoke of obedience. So we can see that with Christianity and on all of these things that happened, you know, with, with apostate Christianity, I'm speaking of, and what happened with the fall of the Roman Empire, it definitely is typical of what's happening today. So I think the German modernism is, I put German there because of the Germanic tribal invasions. I could have put just modernism, but, uh, Modernism is a rejection of the scriptures as a source of authority. That's the way I would define it. So then we have this, uh, therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. Now, this phrase, return, uh, or be grieved, return, and have indignation, we added this up. So that's H3512, H7725, and H2194. Right. So we added those up and we get 13,431. And we counted this from June 7th, 1982. Now, why did we count it from June 7th, 1982 to March 16th, 2019? So why do we do that? What's June 7th, 1982? That's when the Pope met, met with Reagan, you know, John Paul II and Reagan. Okay, so we got Pope John Paul II. And Ronald Reagan, they're going to meet on June 7th, 1982. Now, how do we attach that? They, he shall be grieved, return, and have indignation 
against the Holy Covenant. And, and historically, that's when paganism tries to destroy Christianity. So uh, we didn't put in there who the he is. But um, when we look at this, um, for the ships of Kittim shall come against him. That's Western Rome. We're going to say that that's the West in, in the present truth application. So who's the him? Uh, we're, we're saying it's Western Rome. So who's the he then that shall be grieved? That would be Western Rome. That's going to be pagan Rome. But how do we apply that then in our history? So I'm going to put this in here. So the historical is this is pagan Rome. Right. That's the one who's grieved. Right. Because the ships of Kittim are going to come against him. Pagan Rome. But if we're going to make a parallel in our history, what would we do? Because we've got Western Rome is the West, but we're saying pagan Rome shall be grieved and returned in every nation. Now, are we making a distinction between pagan Rome and Western Rome? Or could we have just put Western Rome in there, shall be grieved and returned and have indignation? But we said that this is going to be paganism that tries to destroy, destroy Christianity. So the Germanic tribes come against Western Rome, which is the West. And we're saying when it says he shall be grieved and return and have indignation, this three-step uh, process. And we're saying the indignation is continuation of the 1260 years of the daily. Um, what is pagan Rome representing in our history? So we could say it's part of the, the West, right? Western Rome, but the West, what is it? If we were going to take this, like, so we have the ships of Kittim coming against. So this is something that's infiltrating Rome, right? The West. But then we're going to say, and the ships of Kittim, these are Germanic tribal invasions. I mean, they're pagans, right? They're not Christians. So they're going to come and start attacking Western Rome. So, but then we have, he shall be grieved and returned out of indignation. Now, this is a three-step process. Is there some place that we could place each of these individually in history, the grief, the return, and the indignation, like historically? Do they refer to some specific events? Is it the response of pagan Rome to the Germanic invasions? You understand, you understand the question that I'm asking? No. So we have, well, just try to frame it. So we have the ships of Kittim, they come against Western Rome. And then we say, well, he shall be grieved, return, and have indignation. So it's showing three steps. He's going to be grieved. He's going to return. And then he shall have indignation against the Holy Covenant. And then it says, so shall he do. He, and we have pagan Rome there, shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. So in the first place, he's going to be grieved, return, and have indignation. And then he's going to do uh, return and have intelligence. Are those three steps? That's a bit more clear. And, and can we place these historically? So first, it's talking about the actions of pagan Rome in its persecutory power at the end of its life. And then it's going to talk about its transition from pagan Rome to papal Rome. That's, that's the way that I understand that. So apostate Christianity is going to dress up, or, well, it's going to be paganism dressed up in Christian garb. So I guess it's paganism that's going to be, uh, become Christianity. But of course, it's not really Christianity. So we're seeing, so we're seeing on the one hand, a three step statement regarding what happens with the fall of Western Rome. And that part is, you know, we have to kind of distinguish what that is uh, compared to the next three steps, the doing, the returning, and having intelligence with them that forsake the whole Holy Covenant. And that's the way I take it is that there's these two groups of three steps. The last three steps um, are addressing how paganism morphs into papalism. 
But notice he's going to return. He's got two different returns, right? He returns in the first three. That's going to be the center one and same in the other one. So the, so the first one is he's going to be grieved, return and have indignation. The next one is he shall do return and have intelligence. I mean, this is chapter three of the great controversy. Maybe we should just read that again. Okay. So chapter three, an era of spiritual darkness. The Apostle Paul, in his second letter to the Thessalonians, foretold the great apostasy, which would result in the establishment of the papal power. He declared that the day of Christ should not come, except there come a falling away first. So that falling away, when we look at, uh, so the, when the ships of Kittim shall come against him, therefore shall he be grieved, sad, disheartened. Turn that shoe, turn back, and then have indignation to foam at the mouth, be enraged. Okay. So we agree that when the ship, ships of Kittim come against him, it's Western Rome that's going to be grieved, returned of indignation. So this is okay. So we know that there's going to be a falling away of the church. So that's going to be those that forsake the Holy Covenant. And, and that's going to be uh, verse 31, where it says, uh, except there come a falling away first, that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And furthermore, the apostle warns his brethren that the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Even at that early date, he saw creeping into the church errors that would prepare the way for the development of the papacy. I think what we would need to do uh, to de deal with this first part is look at chapter two. So we talk about the first centuries, the persecution uh, that happens. Let me see here if I can find this. Um, here, I'm going to read this as well. So it's not too long, at least read parts of it. Okay, when Jesus revealed to his disciples the fate of Jerusalem and the scenes of the second advent, he foretold also the experience of his people from the time when he should be taken from them to his return in power and glory, their deliverance. From all of it, the Savior beheld the storms about to fall upon the apostolic church and penetrating deeper into the future, his eyes discerned the fierce, wasting tempests that were to beat upon his followers in the coming ages of darkness and persecution. In a few brief utterances of awful significance, he foretold the portion which the rulers of this world would mete out to the church of God. The followers of Christ must tread the same path of humiliation, reproach, and suffering which their master trod. The enmity that burst forth against the world's redeemer would be manifested against all who should believe on his name. The history of the early church testified to the fulfillment of the Savior's words. The powers of earth and hell arrayed themselves against Christ in the person of his followers. Paganism foresaw that should the gospel triumph, her temples and altars would be swept away. Therefore, she summoned her forces to destroy Christianity. The fires of persecution were kindled. Christians were stripped of their possessions and driven from their homes. They endured a great fight of, of afflictions. They had a trial, trial of cruel mockings and scourging, Jay, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. Great numbers sealed their testimony with their blood. Noble and slave, rich and poor, learned and ignorant were alike slain without mercy. These persecutions beginning under Nero about the time of the martyrdom of Paul, continued with greater or less fury for centuries. Christians were falsely accused of the most dreadful crimes and declared to be the cause of great calamities, famine, pestilence, and earthquake. As they became the objects of popular hatred and suspicion, informers stood ready for the sake of gain to betray the innocent. They were condemned as rebels against the empire, as foes of religion, as pests to society. Great numbers were thrown to wild beasts or burned alive in the amphitheaters. Some were crucified. Others were covered with skins of wild animals and thrust in the arena to be torn by dogs. Their punishment was often made the chief entertainment at public, public fets. 
uh, vast multitudes assembled to enjoy the sight and greeted their dying agonies with laughter and applause. Fates. I, I can never remember how to pronounce that word, F-E-T-E-S. Wherever they sought refuge, the followers of Christ were hunted like beasts of praise, of prey. Uh, they were forced to seek concealment in desolate and solitary places, right? So we can see that uh, we know that this happens, of course, later during the 1260 years of papal persecution. But even during the time of pa- pagan persecution, we see the same thing, that they have to, in a sense, flee into the wilderness, right? Destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. The catacombs uh, afforded shelter for thousands. Beneath the hills outside the city of Rome, long galleries had been tunneled through earth and rock. The dark and intricate network of passages extended for miles beyond the city walls. In these underground retreats, the followers of Christ buried their dead. And here also, when suspected and proscribed, they found a home. When the life giver shall awaken those who have fought the good fight, many a martyr for Christ's sake will come from those gloomy caverns. Under the fiercest persecution, these witnesses for Jesus kept their faith unsolved. Though deprived of every comfort, shut away from the light of the sun, making their home in the dark, but friendly bosom of the earth, they uttered no complaint. With words of faith, patience, and hope, they encouraged one another to endure privation and distress. The loss of every earthly blessing could not force them to renounce their belief in Christ. Trials and persecution were but steps, bringing them nearer their rest and their reward. Like God's servants of old, many were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. These called to mind the words of their master, that when persecuted for Christ's sakes, Christ's sake, they were to be exceeding glad, for great would be their reward in heaven. For so the prophets had been persecuted before them. They rejoiced that they were accounted worthy to suffer for the truth and songs of triumph ascended from the midst of crackling flames. Looking upward by faith, they saw Christ and angels leaning over the battlements of heaven, gazing upon them with the deepest interest and regarding their steadfastness with approval. A voice came down to them from the throne of God. Be thou faithful unto death and I will give thee. A crown of life. Okay, so um, so if we look at this persecution that's happening, we can see that this is paganism, right? So that was the basic idea that I had in this first part here, where it says they shall be grieved, return, and have indignation. Does this describe what we just read? I would think so. Okay. Banjo makes a comment, which which I don't think I would do because these are the kitten is just a symbol of things that come from the Mediterranean, the Isles. So it's, it's a symbol of the, it's the Germanic tribes, not Greece or Turkey. That's, you know, it wouldn't be Islam or anything like that. I understand kind of the question. So, so one of the things, I mean, we know that Islam isn't going to begin until 622, right? I mean, that's going to be, uh, and and it's not going to have a huge influence at that time, the time when we have this transition. Uh, so that's like a hundred years later. So I don't know if I would put think that way. Anyways, just a comment on her on her point. So so we can see that this first part, the grieved return and have indignation, is describing what we see in chapter two of the Great Controversy. So we can agree to that paganism trying to destroy Christianity. I would think so. Okay. So I put here German paganism seeks to destroy true Protestantism. Now, that definitely happens in Germany, right? But but we can see it's it's infection in the West. Now, when we think of German paganism, what do we think of? Maybe you don't think of this, but this is what I think, I think of what I what little I know no no know of Wagner. I mean I've heard some of the operas and what have you. Okay, but, but, so we've got Wagner, but also we have, what about, um, you know, the stories, you know, like uh, Hansel and Gretel and, uh, oh, um, yeah. the, you know, all of those stories dealing with these demons and witches and, uh, 
Does that have an influence in the modern world? Jack and Jill went up the hill. You know, Disney. <laughs> What's that? Jack and Jill went up the hill. Well, that's English. <laughs> yeah, that's Jack, and Jill. Well, Jack and Jill must be <laughs> Okay. I'm thinking more of Grim, like Grimm's fairy tales and stuff like that. Well, okay. that's nursery rhymes from England. Yeah, well, no, so. because the royal family is 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 German. Yeah, all of this magic there for sure. Yeah, all this magic stuff, you know, that kids are exposed to. It's, it you know, in contrast, you know, my kids were raised on the Bible. They weren't raised with, you know, Disney. They didn't idolize witches, you know, because. You know, first witches are bad, but then you got good witches and, you know, all the stuff that Disney has, right? So you can have the wicked witch, but you can also have, you know, all kinds of magic. And that, that's what I call German paganism. Its influence on the West has been, you know, within the world of fantasy, uh, escapism, but it's definitely anti-Christian and it's definitely pagan, you know, and even, even things like the Wizard of Oz, even though it's not great. German paganism. It's it's influenced in that world. And and I always think of Disney as like so anti anti Christian, so anti Bible. And and you know, growing up, you know, people think, oh, Disney's wonderful, it's for kids and all that. But it just creates a another mythology for Americans that they can replace the Bible. You know, I, I think that the Bible stories are the stories that children should learn first. Probably the only stories we really need to learn. So I, I think that that influence within in how it destroys Protestantism, there's many different facets. It, it affected education. It affected uh, philosophy. It affected art and music and drama. And, you know, you just can go on and on literature. Uh, obviously the television, the movie industry, the entertainment industry, all of these things are permeated with these ideas and they become a replacement for Christianity, especially for Protestantism. In some ways they're, they're very compatible with Catholicism. So we're going to say that all of that is, he's going to be grieved, return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. This is paganism trying to destroy Christianity, and it's German paganism seeking to destroy true Protestantism in our time. And then it says, so shall he do, he pagan Rome shall even return. Now, I, I think, <laughs> now usually when it says he shall do, I mean, that's a wide variety of meaning. Sometimes we refer to it to the persecution, and I think that's what it's it's referring to, but he shall return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. So this is describing what happens uh, in the transition from pagan paganism to papalism. So that's the great controversy, chapter three. So I'm just going to go there again and read some of this again. So she says, uh, page 49, little by little at first, in stealth and silence, and then more openly as it increased in strength and gained control of the minds of men, the mystery of iniquity carried forward its deceptive and blasphemous work. Almost imperceptible, imperceptibly, the customs of heathenism found their way into the Christian church. The spirit of compromise and conformity was restrained for a time by the fierce persecutions which the church endured under paganism. But as persecution, persecution ceased, the Christian and Christianity entered the courts and palaces of kings. She laid aside the humble simplicity of Christ and his apostles for the pomp and pride of pagan priests and rulers. And in place of the requirements of God, she substituted human theories and traditions. The nominal conversion of Constantine in the early part of the fourth century caused great rejoicing and the world cloaked with a form of righteousness, walked into the church. Now, the work of corruption rapidly progressed. Paganism, while appearing to be vanquished, became the conqueror. Her spirit controlled the church. Her doctrines, ceremonies, and superstitions were incorporated into the faith and worship of the professed followers of Christ. This compromise between paganism and Christianity 
resulted in the development of the man of sin foretold in prophecy as opposing and exalting himself above God. That gigantic system of false religion is a masterpiece of Satan's power, a monument of his efforts to seat himself upon the throne to rule the earth according to his will. Satan once endeavored to form a compromise with Christ. Right, so it's going to talk about in the wilderness there um, of temptation. So I'm not going to read all of this here. There's another part. So she says here, page 54, in the early part of the fourth century, or 52, I guess it is, it's 53. In the early part of the fourth century, the Emperor Constantine issued a decree making Sunday a public festival throughout the Roman Empire. The Day of the Sun was reverenced by his pagan subjects and was honored by Christians. It was the Emperor's policy to unite the conflicting interests of heathenism and Christianity. He was urged to do this by the bishops of the church who, inspired by ambition and thirst for power, perceived that if the same day was observed by both Christians and heathen, it would promote the nominal acceptance of Christianity by pagans and thus advance the power and glory of the church. But while many God-fearing Christians were gradually led to regard Sunday as possessing a degree of sacredness, they still held the true Sabbath as the holy of the Lord and observed it in obedience to the fourth commandment. The arch deceiver had not completed his work, right? So um, talk about the Sabbath here. And then it's going to be this here on page 54. In the sixth century, the papacy had become a fir firmly established. Its seat of power was fixed by the imperial city and the Bishop of Rome was declared to be the head of the entire church. Paganism had given place to the papacy. The dragon had given to the beast his power, his seat and great authority. And again, we have three steps there in, in Revelation chapter 13. And now began the 1260 years of papal oppression foretold in the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. Christians were forced to choose either to yield their integrity and accept the papal ceremonies and worship or to wear away their lives in dungeons or suffer death by the rag, rack, the faggot, or the, pa or the headsman's axe. Uh, now were fulfilled the words of Jesus. You shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolk and friends. And some of you shall make cause to be put to death. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Persecution opened upon the faithful with greater fury than ever before. And the world became a vast battlefield. For hundreds of years, the church of Christ found refuge in seclusion and obscurity. Thus says the prophet, the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. Okay, so do we agree that this, this makes sense, that that's what's being described here in Daniel chapter 11, that that verse 30 is addressing the fall of Western Rome and then the movement from paganism to papalism. So if that's the case, when it says he, pagan Rome, shall return and have intelligence with them that forsake the whole holy covenant. How do, if we say that this is the papacy that's having intelligence with that, as we said, this is going to be, well, what we put here was, can we do that? Can we just put that there? That that's going to be uh, having intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant. So more that we put here, Pagan Rome, we're going to put John Paul II. Well, I mean, he's not the only one, I guess, but, but. I think I prefer that one saying just the papacy, but I see your, your reason on this with John Paul, but he's, he's the one that is kind of the, the one at the, toward the very end. Yeah, I know. But, but I, I just think that that's, that's going to be, the thing that connects us to the time of the end, right? Because we're going to say our arm shall stand on his part, right? And um, so we're going to we're going to put that because of the December 25th. I put it as December 25th, 1991. So, so are you, yeah. Are you going to equate 410 AD with 1982? Uh, yes, because okay. So so what it says he shall return. So what we have is he shall do, he shall return, 
and have intelligence. So maybe, maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe I should put, I don't know. That's a good question. I have to think about it still. Because when it comes to him doing, and this is, this is, uh, yeah, I don't know. See, yeah, I'm not sure. I, I don't know if I'm doing this right. Would you, okay, but if we're not using 1982, would we use 1929? Yeah. yeah I'm just thinking, okay. So the first part, we have this influence that comes against the United States, right? Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, so what we don't have, so when it says, therefore, he pagan Rome shall be grieved, return, have indignation against them that forsake the Holy Covenant. So shall he do, he pagan Rome. Now, the question is, you know, because this is addressing with Western Rome. So we have Western Rome, but we also have pagan Rome in that history. Now, we're saying they're the same thing. So I don't know. I don't there's something I'm not doing right. I'm pretty sure I've got something wrong. Okay, maybe when it says he shall be grieved, return to them indignation. I, I, I don't have a problem with that being uh, pagan, pagan Rome persecuting Christians, right? That's, Theodore. Yeah. Brother, can you remind me what happened in 1982? John Paul II and, and uh, Reagan met. Oh, okay. All right. Thank yeah. you. So, okay, so so the part that we have here is so we have German modernism coming against the West, and then it says therefore, and we're saying the Western Rome against him, right? So that's the Western Rome. We're going to say that that's the West. For he, well, that's we put pagan Rome. We didn't put Western Rome because we're emphasizing here the pagan aspect of it, right? It's the paganism of Rome. Because Rome is falling as a nation, right, as an empire. But it's the pagan aspect of Rome that's greed, the one that's worried about Christianity coming and taking over and so that they're going to lose their temples and all their sacrifices and everything. That's what Ellen White says. So pagan Rome is grieved. Now, is there a specific point that we mark that it's grieved? You understand what I'm asking? Because because we don't we, we haven't marked when he's grieved, when he returns. Now, when he has indignation, I mean, this would be. Do can we mark them in some specific ways? And if that's the case, can we then know what pagan Rome is representing that's also grieved and return and has indignation against the Holy Covenant? So I'm still not happy with what we have here. I think there's something that we're missing or something I'm doing wrong because it doesn't flow like the other things do. Yep. So, so we have these three steps. Now we also know that, you know, the dragon's going to give its power seat and great authority. Those we can mark historically. Now, so I, I think what, what we have to do is we have to get this 310 AD. I think it's in the wrong spot. Right, because this is going to be, this is going to be more about here. So I don't know why I put it there, because that doesn't even make sense. You said 310, didn't you mean 410? Yeah, I meant 410. Okay. Just because just I say something doesn't mean I was thinking it. So what about grieved? So we're going to put 410. Now, can we have something here that this grieving has to do with Constantine? No. So, what's that? How would you see that? I don't know. I don't know. It's just when I look at that 3512, for some reason, it reminds me of Constantine, but I'm not sure why. Well, I would, okay. So the return is, is when they respond to the Germanic invasions, right? So we, um, so in 310 AD, I don't know what we call the event. So, um, the sack of Rome on the 24th of August in 410 AD was undertaken by the Visigoths, led by the King Alaric. At that time, Rome was no longer the capital of the Western Roman Empire, having been replaced in that position first by 
melolanum, now Milan, in 286, and then by Ravenna in 402. Nevertheless, the city of Rome retained a paramount position as the eternal city, as the spiritual center of the empire. This was the first time in almost 800 years that Rome had fallen to a foreign enemy, and the sack was a major shock of contemporaries, friends, and foes of the empire alike. The sacking of 410 is seen as a major landmark in the fall of Western Roman Empire. Okay. The Germanic tribe. So I'm just reading some stuff. The Goths. So the question is, when are they Greek? There's a lot of history here. So we have lots dealing with the fall of the Roman Empire. Okay, so it says that the sack of Rome went from uh, the 24th of August in 410. So it's going to be on that date. There's some other dates in here, but okay. Okay, so what about this? Um, so that's going to be, so we were putting that as the return. He shall return. So that's what, that's the date Stephen had given us. Kind of interesting when you look at that on the, as you were just saying, 24th of August of 410. Yeah. You look at that on the Julian calendar, the biblical calendar then becomes the sixth day of the sixth month of 4455. Yeah. Yeah. So the sixth day of the sixth month on the biblical calendar. When you also look at the Julian day, it's 1871045. Yeah. So you get the 187 there. So I just, so I just think that there, there must be, cause if we're going to put that as a return, you know, I still need to, and, and then they have indignation. There's just lots of information that I don't have. I don't know this history extremely well, right? I mean, we know it because we study it, uh, you know, in connection with Bible prophecy, but the things that we never touch on, we never touch on. So, I just wonder what it would mean that he's grieved. Like what, if that's an event, if there's something, would that just be the first attacks? So therefore he pagan Rome. Now, if we applied this to our history, I mean, we have to understand the history itself first, but if, if we're going to say he's going to be grieved, so this would be events, you know, and when does, when do they have indignation against the Holy Covenant? Is there some event like we have German paganism seeks to destroy true Protestantism, but is there there's some some specific things that we can appoint that we can point to specific events like with the intelligence he shall do he shall even return and for some reason I don't know why I put uh, 410 there I think it's just because I put it in the wrong spot and have intelligence um, so this returning and have intelligence. Okay, so yeah, I'm I'm still thinking. <laughs> okay, twenty fourth of August at four ten was when the Visigoths and Alaric sacked Rome, right? Right. Yeah, that's the date they give us there in Wikipedia. Okay, yeah. but at that time, Rome was no longer the capital of the Western Empire. No, it's not. It's going to be Ravenna or whatever. But it's part of the progressive destruction of Western Rome. And, it, and, and what we're addressing here is, are we addressing, uh, pagan Rome? Is it paganism that's grieved and returns and have, has indignation against the Holy Covenant? Yeah. So just going back to our chart here. So that's going to be, well, the Visigoths or the Goths. So that we have here 395 to 410. So I guess it's 410 where I don't know. You said we had them returning, but I don't know. I'm not sure if we're doing this right. I think there's something we're missing just because of the lack of knowledge. Yeah, so we're going to have to come back to this tomorrow. We're still getting stuck here, but I, I haven't been spending as much time on this as I was because I've been doing that paper on the eclipse. So hopefully I can dig up some stuff here. Yeah, I'm going to have to think about this. Well, hopefully other people can think about it as well. Let's close with a word of prayer, unless somebody has something specific they want to say. Okay. The dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning. We ask for your continued help in understanding these things. And um, be with each person, bless them and keep them. Be with us throughout this week, we pray and ask in Jesus' name.